Welcome to Tibetscape's Conversation, a podcast from Tibetscape, the research group on Tibet and the Himalayan region at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. We have with us today Dr. Swarajyoti Gohen, sociologist and anthropologist at Ashoka University in New Delhi, who is also currently the head of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the university. She will speak to us today about her new book, Imagined Geographies in Indo-Tibetan Borderlands: Culture, Politics, Place, published by Amsterdam University Press. Welcome, Swarajyoti. Thank you very much, uh, Sonika. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you, and I am very grateful to Tibet Cape for giving me this opportunity. I've been following the work of Tibet Cape for some time now, and it's quite impressive. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'd like to uh, begin by asking you to place your work in the broader context of academic research on Tibet and Tibetan borderlands in India. Um, I came to Tibetan studies through the roots of the Himalayan borderlands. So I always say that you know I came to uh, Tibetan studies actually from the margins, from the borders. And my interest in Tibet and Bhutan actually also developed once I started doing work in our natural Pradesh in Tawang and West Kaming districts, which are together called Monul. And I realized that the usual lens that one adopts uh, while uh, doing research in uh, Northeast India on uh, autonomy demands, on uh, ethnic politics, does not really fit in the case uh, that I was studying. And I realized that I had to know more about Tibet and Bhutan and Tibetan Buddhist regions in order to understand what is going on in Manuel. And so uh, my entry, my understanding of uh, this region has to then also take into account Tibet and Tibet's neighbors. So yeah. you, you spoke about the, about the Manuel autonomy movement in your book, and that is one of the major focus in your research as well. Uh, yes, recently yes. this year, we've seen some revival of the the Monial regional autonomy movement. So how do you link that with what you have observed during your field work to what is happening now? Yes. So this movement uh, really began as a one man's vision, uh, which is that of the late Sona Gonse Rinpoche, the E.G. Rinpoche, as he was known in short by everybody who knew him. He was a monk politician from Tawang and later he became an elected political representative. He had this vision of uh, bringing autonomy to Tawang and West Kaming, which are both, you know, Buddhist districts in Arunachal Pradesh. And he thought that, you know, he could use the model of the Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council. And in the initial stages of the movement, he even invited a Ladakhi Lama to guide the people of Monul as to how to go about their demand for autonomy. And the main agendas of the autonomy demand, according to his vision, were development and cultural preservation. That is Tibetan Buddhist cultural preservation. And so the idea was that if autonomy was granted, then the more autonomous region that would be formed would not have to depend on the state government of Arunachal Pradesh to make their own policies on development and cultural promotion. But what I found out when I was doing my field work uh, was that the development agenda was the secondary one. And the main agenda was, of course, Tibetan Buddhist cultural preservation. And uh, it actually showed me how the autonomy movement is linked to the larger politics and larger cultural programs that are unfolding all over the Himalayan region, the Indian Himalayan region more specifically, which is to basically unite the Tibetan Buddhist communities of the borderlands uh, of uh, India, the Himalayan borderlands, into some kind of a cultural alliance. And so the movement for autonomy was basically the window through which I could see this larger politics, larger processes unfolding. And in 2014, P.G. Rinpoche met a very unfortunate uh, death, very sudden death. And after that, of course, the movement uh, was suspended for some time. And then it was revived by other political representatives, other people, uh, educated people, professionals, and that is of a, a very different character from what the Rinpoche had, of course, you know, introduced it or how he had envisioned it in the beginning. It has changed its character. There are a lot of people who still want the autonomy movement to 
um, happened to gain place and eventual autonomy to be granted to Monul. But the leaders have changed and that has actually led to a lot of uh, changes also in the uh, nature of the movement. So, um, to get back to the framework that, we, that you've used in your book, Himalayas as an imagined space of belonging, uh, yeah. can you talk a little bit more about that? I call the Himalayas an imagined space because it's a, it is a sense of belonging that comes from identifying with a particular, you know, cultural tradition, which is the Tibetan Buddhist cultural tradition. And I also focus on how uh, the Himalayas has now stepped in as a terminological substitute for Tibetan Buddhism in India. And I show how this is related to the tensions, uh, the border tensions between India and China where Tibet is claimed by China and uh, the Tibetan borderlands in this sense need to find an uh, Indian space of belonging. And so Himala is a, a less controversial term that uh, then has to become the substitute for Tibetan Buddhism. And I call it an imagined space because all the communities which are subsumed within it live in various Himalayan border regions. Mm. Um, I also distinguish it from long-distance nationalism. Because it does not necessarily pertain to diaspora or exile community. And I also distinguish it from ethnic homeland because it does not really demand a Tibetan Buddhist territorial homeland. It is more for, you know, cultural geography, a geography mm. of belonging that is imagined. And given the background of the India-China conflict, I find it very interesting how, you know, the Indian Himalayas is stressed in the idea of the Himalayan geography. And what uh, I found uh, interesting in your book is that you uh, specifically flag not contiguity in your framework in reimagining this uh, Buddhist uh, space. And you spoke a little bit about this. But how does one square this with the current uh, emphasis on territoriality? Yes, it's not just uh, this very territoriality that undergirds, you know, the political divisions that we have in India. That itself uh, makes it difficult to imagine the Himalayan uh, geography as a contiguous space. Because I actually came up with this concept of non-contiguity when uh, theorizing the Himalayan geography because of, the, because of the fact that, you know, the alliance that was building was among communities who were separated already into different territorial units or political units of, um, in different states, so Ladakh, you know, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, and involving groups that were distributed in different political units. So they, they're coming together not, uh, through any demand for, you know, political reorganization on the basis of, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but more through a sense of uh, cooperation, alliance, and through, uh, cultural programs. So the cultural programs gave a concrete, uh, basis to their movement, to their, you know, collaborative, uh, endeavor. So, I think that one had to uh, find a way to theorize this uh, cultural alliance because it is not ethnic homeland. They did not really want uh, the uh, the kind of geography that they were imagining to become a homeland, at least not now, not yet. So it is not a homeland uh, vision that is animating their activities or their discourse. It is not even, you know, long this is nationalism as I mentioned. So it is something else. And that is why, you know, non-contiguity is important. I mean, non-contiguity is a framework that was also used to uh, define long-distance nationalism, especially for people who have been displaced away from their uh, motherland, from their homeland. But this is not a framework that can uh, one can apply in the case that I am describing. And hence, uh, one had to think of a different theoretical lens. And then uh, you uh, operationalize this lens by referring to Buddhism as a boundary marker. Right. Then. So could you talk to us a little bit more about how that is to be understood in the context of the way you talk about non-contiguity? Yeah. So that's another interesting aspect um, of the kind of geography that I've been talking about. Uh, because uh, although it did not have any territorial boundaries, it still had symbolic and cultural boundaries, which is that of Buddhism. So Buddhism was Tibetan Buddhism. And more of an Indian kind of Tibetan Buddhism was the framework through which uh, these different communities were talking about alliance. And uh, we also uh, see this in the common programs that uh, the, different, the leaders of these different communities have been 
pushing for through organizations such as the Himalayan Buddhist Cultural Association that I mentioned a while ago. And uh, these common programs include uh, pushing for the inclusion of uh, Tibetan language or Bhoti, as it is called here, in the eighth schedule of the Indian Constitution. Or another agenda, which is the promotion of uh, Soa Rikpa, which is the Tibetan system of uh, medicine or the science of healing, as it is translated. Uh, so how to how to incorporate these cultural practices into more institutionalized forms within India. So that became the common program that united uh, the concrete programs that united these different uh, communities which are pushing for uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism or the promotion of Tibetan Buddhism within India. And that's why, you know, Buddhism became a boundary marker. Now, if we look at the regional settings of all these, there are other communities who also live in these different regions. Now, what the imagination of Buddhism as the glue, the glue that binds together these communities, what that does is it does, you know, become exclusive in some sense because it also then uh, does not include uh, other groups who may not be Tibetan Buddhists in their, in the, in the religion or in their religious practices. So then although there isn't any territorial boundaries of this imagined community, Buddhism still becomes a kind of a boundary marker, a symbolic boundary marker. So would you say uh, it would be uh, a correct understanding of your work that you have uh, built a bridge between a cultural and a social reimagining of political community to a political institutionalization of political community in which you talk about um, the EU or the non-alignment movement. And then, uh, would it be fair to say that your book could offer a practical approach to reimagining community in the Himalayan region in the context of the border conflicts and the environmental challenges that it's currently facing? I would uh, say that at this moment, uh, the geography that uh, I'm curating about is of a cultural makeup. But given the territorial disputes between India and China, the recurring uh, disputes between about, regarding boundary alignment, that has definitely alerted the Indian Tibetan Buddhist communities uh, about the need to somehow distance themselves from, uh, you know, Tibet as a political space. And I'm not talking about Tibetans in India, but I'm talking about the need to distance Tibet because Tibet is part of China and they are part of India. So this kind of, uh, you know, awareness and alert, uh, alertness to these, to, to, to the political divisions between India and China also is important in understanding why, uh, India Himalayas as a cultural geography also has a political undertone. What happens? What is the merit of, uh, of building an alliance based on cultural practices, which are uh, projected as being, you know, very Indian. That they are particular. That they are also part of Indian culture. They are part of Indian tradition. So that kind of uh, representation is very important, uh, and that representation is there in the Himalayan uh, geography that I talk about. Uh, I'd like to shift uh, gears a bit now and uh, ask you to share with uh, us. Uh, your experience of field work that, you know, uh, you spent a number of years doing this work in uh, regions where um, access is difficult and uh, the focus on re those regions dominantly has been a securitized focus. So share with us what your experience of field work has been and how you uh, you can see this field developing further for researchers that might want to be, uh, in, that might want to take this further. Well, I think that my fieldwork uh, really helped me uh, in many ways because it was spread over a period of 10 years. I began this work as part of my doctoral uh, field work in 2007 and 2008. But uh, I submitted my doctoral thesis in 2013, but I continued my field studies until 2018. So there was this 10-year period during which I continued my field studies in Taiwan West coming. And so I witnessed, you know, the changes that happened over this period, over this, you know, 10 past years. Uh, Sona Gonsarin he 
unfortunately died in 2014, and that changed the course of the autonomy demand, uh, you know, like I mentioned. And I also saw many, you know, new monasteries uh, coming up, many Buddhist institutes of learning, Buddhist centers have developed. Uh, and I, when I started in 2007, the Rinpoche at that time, he was protesting against the renaming of local place names by the Indian army. And by 2017, these, you know, older place names had been restored. And so you could see that there were new sign words on the side of the roads which had the older place names in lieu of the military given names. So, you know, you could see all these changes and that, you know, temporal kind of uh, uh, factor really helped me, I think, to give some insight. And also it was, it's a very heavily militarized region, like you mentioned. Uh, so there were challenges of, uh, you know, doing field work. I mean, unlike some other con- uh, places in India where the relations between the Indian army and the local population are really fraught, that is not the case in Pawang. So that, of course, again, made a difference. But it is definitely a very militarized region and most you can see most of the roads which have been built built to connect um, military spaces and settlements. And so in order to go to uh, more far-flung uh, villages, you still had to go the unconventional way. So there are no uh, concrete roads to many villages yet. They're still unconnected. So I mean, there are all these challenges of transport and connectivity while doing uh, work in Tawang. Although my, um, I come from, you know, Gohati, which is my hometown, but going from Gohati to Tawang was also a challenge many times. Bombila, which is in West Coming, is nearer to Gohati, and it takes around 8 hours, but Tawang is 16 hours. And when I started, you know, uh, doing field work, there was only one road which connected uh, Assam and Tawang and the Bombila. Now, later, there was another road which was built. That road is in a better shape. And that road, I think the new road, I think, came up in 2016 or 17. Or I think 17. And so before that, every time you wanted to go to Bombila and Tawang, you had to use the road which goes through Tejpur, which is like the, uh, you know, um, town in Assam, which borders uh, West Kamang district. And so uh, every time, you know, there would be floods. There would be landslides, there would be road blockage, and it was like a very frequent experience to go and then find that you're stuck for one day at the border outpost between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh because there has been some landslides, and the road is so narrow you can go further. So you know these are uh, some challenges um, of doing field work there. But apart from that, I found uh, that this is a place which um, has uh, people who are very nice. I mean, I don't want to essentialize anything, but I found the people extremely nice, extremely helpful and friendly, and that really made my work experience lovely. And uh, that you shared with us these challenges of field work, and you've uh, now written about it so extensively in terms of your academic engagement with this region, which is largely understood as a borderlands region. How do you uh, place this in the context of how borders are being studied in India? And is there, like, for example, would you say that we have a subdiscipline of borderland studies in India? Looking forward, what do you see the the research developing in that? And what is the state of the field as of now? I don't think that uh, border studies is uh, well developed in India. In fact, when I was starting to do my research, uh, there was one book that I cited, and that was a book called The Bengal Borderlands by Willem van Schendel, who is a Netherlands-based uh, academic. And he's written, you know, anthropological and historical studies on the Bengal, uh, in the Bangladesh uh, border with India. So that was, at least, you know, as, um, as I knew, that was the only account of, you know, social history and anthropological account of border that I was reading at that time. There have been historical studies, there have been political studies of the border, but very few uh, in public knowledge. I'm sure there are other books, but to my knowledge, I did not find many on uh, an, uh, anthropological accounts or historical accounts of the borders that India shares with uh, different neighbors. In fact, I also think this is to do with the kind of uh, focus that partition studies has in India. And partition studies, there is uh, we know that there is a tough field called partition studies in India, and this is to do, of course, with the trauma, the violence that accompanied the country's division. 
but that also has meant that you know other studies of other borders uh, and more anthropological historical kind of social geography studies uh, has not really uh, gained space as as you know border studies the way border studies has developed in the west and in the west of course border studies um, developed uh, mostly to study the us mexico border and in europe uh, border studies developed uh, because of the border uh, cross border exchanges and cross border uh, identities that were being formed and the eu is an example so border studies had a different context in europe and north america uh, so there are some institutionalized you know, spaces there are organizations called the asian borderlands research network which is a netherlands based network then the association for border studies which was also a uh, which study started as the us mexico uh, research network they later expanded. So we don't have those kind of institutionalized spaces which focus on border studies in India. We do have individuals, though, who are working on border studies. But I think, um, I do think that we need more work on the Himalayan borderlands, uh, more anthropological, historical, and social geography work on the Himalayan borderlands in India. Thank you so much, Swargajoti, for this interview and for sharing your work with the Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you.